Just be seated. All right, we have a ancillary hearing regarding forfeiture in 08 CR 111 regarding, I believe, the uh, pickup truck and some money uh, found in the pickup truck at the time of the arrest of Mr. Osborne. Is that correct? And a uh, cell phone. All right, the party's ready to proceed. And Ms. Rigg, I believe you're here on behalf of Mrs. McLean, who yes, is sir. who is on the title, as I've been told, to the pickup truck. Actually, she's the purchaser of the pickup truck. She paid for it. She bought it. She's on the title. She's registered on the yes, Is she one of two people on the title? Yes, sir. She's, his name is on the title of the competition, yes, sir. Uh, but, and, um, we have someone just wanted to address your response. All right. Ms. McLean did not receive any notice, any written notice of the hearing. And um, I understand it was supposed to have gone out registered mail under uh, the statute. It didn't. She went to the Aberdeen Post Office this morning. There's not been any registered mail sent for in the last month. Uh, I got a copy of the motion this morning. I've been on vacation, but I come back. Got a copy of it this morning. Um, it says that it was sent to a post office box address. Post office didn't have anything to wait for. I don't know, maybe it's been returned. But I um, I did speak with Miss Garrett. Are you not ready to go forward then? Well, my point is that the statute says she's supposed to get, shall be mailed and published four weeks prior to the ancillary hearing. Well, that's the four weeks notice is for people who can't be determined who owns a vehicle, a title owner, I, I agree with you, needs to have sufficient notice to to prepare and defend, but the the publication notices for those other people who might claim an interest in property that otherwise isn't doesn't have a title and so on. But but if you say she doesn't have notice, if you're not ready to go forward then we won't go forward. Unless unless there's proof of notice. That's up to you, Ms. Rigg. If you're not ready to go forward, I'm not going to make Ms. McLean go forward. to sit up here because you certainly have a an interest in hearing and being heard and the microphones are on the side of the bar and, and your honor for the record uh, the Commonwealth uh, sent the notice out uh, as we did on the certificate on the 18th of November we've not received anything back and it was sent to this uh, PO address which was based upon the uh, affidavit, the innocent owner affidavit and documents that she filed with the court uh, back, I guess, in October of last year. All right. Well, in any event, Ms. McLean, through her attorney, Deborah Rick, has indicated she is willing to go forward today and would like to get this matter. I'm with ready to proceed. Uh, yes, Your Honor, with some, some direction uh, from the court. We uh, uh, we conducted this trial here recently. Uh, Ms. McClain was present during the trial itself. Uh, is there, uh, and I've not done one of these uh, hearings before, Your Honor, and uh, this was scheduled yesterday. Uh, so I'm not real clear. Do we need to cover everything that we covered in the trial itself because, because that has been presented already 
I don't want to have two full days of testimony to go uh, through I all examination, cross-examination, but, but the, the uh, basic facts, I don't know what can be agreed on, what might not be agreed on. Ms. Lubensato, do you have any input? Um, my understanding from, and I, and I reviewed the case law again, um, in regards to Mr. Osborne and forfeiture of his property, his claim, it is testimony presented or evidence presented at the trial, which this court and both sides are aware of all of that. It is not a do-over on that testimony. In regards to Ms. McLean, I imagine that if she has a, a statement because there's use and control and knowledge um, issues, then I imagine there might be some sort of testimony offered um, from their side on that. But in regards to him, I have not seen anything that says you reiterate or go over the testimony presented at trial and submitted to a jury. That it's, it is what the record is, is what the evidence is submitted on. That's it. But I don't know what they have in regards to Jewel McLean's claim. Well, I would think that you need some kind of evidence regarding title and ownership. It may be in the file from prior things, but I think to iterate that or reiterate that would be good to have in the record with regard to Ms. McLean's ownership, involvement, knowledge, knowledge of use, allow of use, and so on and so forth. Um, there are some items of evidence I trust that were not put forth in the trial itself, which could um, be relevant uh, on any of the three sides, uh, and I'll allow what you think is in that regard. Thank you, Commonwealth calls uh, eight you, you want to give a, just a brief summary of or an opening of what you intend to say or what has been said so keep those points in mind. Uh, sure, Your Honor. The trial that we had in this case uh, was based upon Mr. Osborne delivering an oxycodone 80, oxycotton 80 tablet to the Simon Kenton location here in Mason County where a drug purchase was done uh, by way of Amy Morgan who made that purchase through Corey Watson and Christina Kimeter on the 9th of June of 2008. Agent Fagan took custody of the uh, pill that was received from Amy Morgan. Uh, and uh, prior to that, he had provided $100 and identified $20 bills to Amy Morgan for that drug purchase. At the conclusion of that controlled drug buy, Officers from the Sheriff's Department from Mason County made a traffic stop on the vehicle that was seen leaving the residence at Simon Kenton Station, Kenton Station Road. And uh, the driver of that vehicle was Robert Joey Osborne. During the course of that traffic stop, uh, there was a search on the vehicle. The uh, purchase money that was done from that drug buy was found in Mr. Osborne's wallet along with a piece of hose clamp. There was also a pill cutter that was found in the vehicle that had drug residue on it. During the course of that traffic stop, Agent Fagan uh, did an interview with Mr. Osborne and at that interview, Mr. Osborne admitted to making a delivery of the tablet to his friend Corey and received money in exchange for that. Mr. Osborne was placed under arrest and after he was placed under arrest and they were in the process of loading this vehicle uh, that he was in, uh, the uh, vehicle that is subject of this forfeiture hearing, uh, the 2006 Dodge 1500, uh, Ms. McLean arrived on the scene. And according to the information that we have 
in the course of that, Ms. McLean was not very pleased with what she saw going on. And she made uh, the statement uh, about uh, money uh, that was on the back of that uh, uh, vehicle was going to be towed off and uh, wanted to know what her son was charged with selling. Um, Agent Fagan replied oxycodone and the mother said to the defendant, uh, I thought you told me you weren't doing this anymore. Part of the uh, other things that were found in the billfold of Mr. Uh, Osborne was some additional cash monies. Uh, there's been testimony in this court by, um, trying to recall who it was from, um, that this, oh, that uh, the sheriff had talked to Mr. Osborne, I believe, and Mr. Osborne said that the money that he had was money that he was going to be making a, a payment for a vehicle uh, with. Uh, Agent Fagan, I expect he also will testify today about the cell phone, uh, that the cell phone had, was the cell phone number and uh, information that was on the cell phone indicated it received a call from Corey um, just before this uh, drug transaction occurred. Uh, that information was also in uh, Agent Fagan's case report. All right. Ms. Lubenzato, anything you want to uh, Well, Your Honor, there were a number of charges that brought against Mr. Osborne. Um, we started with trafficking, then there was a superseding indictment for complicity. In the middle of trial, uh, we went added trafficking again. Um, he was also charged with possession of a controlled substance. He was charged with possession of drug paraphernalia. Um, there was testimony given. At no time did he ever make that statement to Agent Fagan, and clearly the jury did not believe that. At this time, he was found guilty of simply facilitation in that he aided Corey Watson in obtaining one pill of oxycodone that um, clearly came from another individual. It was not a prescription belonging to Mr. Osborne. There was no residue of that pill found in his vehicle. There was nothing like that pill found on his person. Um, there is the $100 in buy money, which has already been taken back by the task force. That is not something that he owes restitution on. Um, when he was stopped, at some point his mother came up and there was some discussion. Uh, what that's about, uh, she is here, to, she can talk about that. But in regards to my client, he admitted nothing of the sort. He has been found guilty of facilitation. And based on that, the Commonwealth simply, under the case law that I have seen, is not entitled to forfeiture of a $20,000 plus vehicle unless there was some evidence presented at trial that said at the time the person carrying the pill to Corey Watson had it that was an illegal possession, that the pill itself was illegal. There was nothing presented. Now, maybe if a search of <coughs> angel had occurred or a statement of angel had been taken or something along those lines, there may have been some evidence presented regarding the status of this pill at the time it was allegedly transported in this vehicle that Robert Osborne was using on that day. Since that wasn't presented, there's no nexus, and we will argue that you, without that nexus and without any evidence whatsoever being presented that this pill was illegally was an illegal pill during the time it had this one ride allegedly in that truck, I don't believe there's any connection to take the truck. Obviously, the issue of cash and the cell phone becomes slightly more difficult for Mr. Osborne, um, but there is still a burden of proof on the Commonwealth based on the evidence presented here at trial. Not on speculation, not on what Agent Fagan believed happened, based on what they presented. And the reason for this, the reason why I'm arguing that, is under the case law, everything says presented at trial, and unless you're dealing with a dismissed charge, in other words, an investigation started and then they withdrew their charge, you have to take what was given to the jury. 
And if the jury comes back with a not guilty, then that's the fact. So if the jury comes back and says he was not guilty of possession of a controlled substance based on the residue in the truck, there's that loss of that connection of the truck and controlled illegal controlled substances. If the jury came back and said not guilty as to possession of drug paraphernalia, the pill cutter, the hose clamps, they've just lost that connection to the truck because you can't say that was in violation of anything in the chapter because they said not guilty. So there would have had to have been other evidence presented to create the nexus. We don't believe they presented that evidence. And based on that, we do not believe they're entitled to forfeiture of the truck. And I don't believe they're going to be entitled to forfeiture of the cash and the cell phone either under the case law and what their burden is. So you're saying the standard this court has to determine is beyond a reasonable doubt? No, it's clear and convincing evidence. However, information was presented to a jury. So at this point, it's not like going back. If you hadn't presented this to a jury, I think we'd be left with nothing beyond the clear and convincing evidence. But at this point, the, it went to them. And since they've rendered a decision, we're now saying, I, I think it would be a, an enormous problem if we then say, well, that's all well and good that they heard the evidence, they made a decision, but now we're going to say it's a lower standard for purposes of trying to get this truck, which led us, I mean, the truck thing led us here to begin with. This has the, been the root of this all along. So I think we have to take into consideration if you're going to say there's a nexus between this truck and illegal substances, illegal drugs, then there should have been some evidence presented outside of what went to the jury because they've made a decision about that and he's not guilty. They don't get a second try at it to say, oh, well, by clear and convincing evidence, he's guilty when it's already been presented to a jury. In that case, I don't think that that exists. If they had dismissed the charges previously, I think we'd be at a different position. But there's been a decision made in this. He's not guilty of possessing a controlled substance illegally. He's not guilty of drug paraphernalia. He's not guilty of trafficking nor complicity too. Why does he have to be guilty of possession of, of oxycodone? Well, they didn't present any other evidence regarding possession of a controlled substance than believe, what was presented I believe they here. did. I believe they presented that Mr. According to their theory that Mr. Osborne delivered the pill to Mr. Watson in the truck and therefore Mr. Watson was in illegal possession of oxycodone. Therefore, no. Under the statute, if, if, if the truck can be forfeited due to facilitation, it doesn't have to be the illegal possession by Mr. Osborne. It may be by Mr. Watson. That's not how my understanding of the case law well, says, right. says that there's a two-pronged test here. I mean, you certainly have to show a nexus of this vehicle. And under Ricard, which is, the I think, right on point here, Ricard pretty much flat out says the vehicle isn't presumptively forfeitable just because this individual, and Ricard was actually the, it wasn't facilitation, he was a flat out deliverer of these um, items. And the second prong becomes, this is for the transport of drugs in violation of the chapter. I'm, I'm summarizing that, obviously. So this pill, now the question becomes, was this one oxycodone pill at the time it was allegedly being driven in the truck because for all we know he got this from Zach Grayson who pulled up in a Jeep at the same time and had a conversation with Corey Watson. But let's just say that it was. What proof was submitted at trial or evidence of any kind was submitted at trial that the actual possessor of the pill during the truck ride had that pill illegally? Are you asking me? I'm, I'm saying there was none. There was no evidence provided that said, if we are to believe that he helped Corey to obtain this through another person, Angel, or Zach Grayson, or whatever, how are we to say there was nothing presented that said, well, she didn't even have a legal prescription? Well, if the court believes that Mr. Osborne said to Mr. Fagan, yes, I delivered a pill, and yes, I got $100 for it, the money's found in his wallet, well, then he would if have been Mr. convicted Watt of testified that Mr. Watson got into the truck, took off, came back, got out of the truck, and that Mr. Osborne didn't get out of the truck, then the pill had to have been delivered in the truck. 
and therefore if Mr. Osborne is found to have facilitated the delivery of the pill, then Mr. Watson had to have had possession of this pill illegally while in the truck. And that seems to be that would be the nexus. Okay. Even if Mr. Osborne, uh, well, in any event, it seems that, that the Rickard case indicates that if the defendant transports pills he has a legal prescription for, gets out of the truck or vehicle with the illegal pills, goes into a building and sells them, you can't forfeit the vehicle. But in this case, there is at least some evidence that the transfer of the pill took place within the vehicle itself. But you have to show that the vehicle is a substantial part of this. How did the pill get here if it hadn't been carried from somewhere else in the truck? I don't know that it was carried in the truck. I don't know if he got it from somebody else. And once again, there's nothing reliable to say that he made that admission to Agent Fagan, other than Agent <coughs> Fagan saying that. The jury didn't believe it. And there's nothing to support it, nothing at all, other than Agent Fagan's word. And based on that, we're saying that, so you're talking one incident that we believe this pill was carried by a person inside hit this truck that he was driving on that day, and this is somehow a substantial connection between trafficking and drugs. I'm that pointing truck. out to you for purposes of presenting the evidence this morning that have, after having read the statute and the cases, it seems that the argument that if even if he had, Mr. Osborne had a prescription for this pill and sold it or delivered it wrongfully, he couldn't have forfeiture of his vehicle. The court's not convinced that's the case if this pill, for example, was delivered within his vehicle after having been transported here for the purpose of sale and with money having been found in Mr. Osborne's possession. I don't necessarily subscribe to your argument at this point uh, subject to being, uh, having it argue both ways, that merely because uh, whether or not he had legal possession himself, if it's transferred, uh, that that would prevent necessarily forfeiture or the argument that it could be forfeited. Well, we, I guess only to follow up on the Ricard standard, we don't know when this was transferred because um, Agent Fagan testified that he lost sight of the vehicle. So whether or not this was actually transferred inside the vehicle, <coughs> Corey Watson was transported to a place where he picked it up from somebody, we don't know. We don't have any evidence about that because there's this lack of sight. Then if you're not, if, if Ricard doesn't do it, then we have Osborne, ironically, the Commonwealth. And then we're going to start looking at that where the nexus they're saying, well, this truck in that case was found with drugs in it. Um, the person was seen using it within a certain amount of time prior to that, which I think may go more to Ms. McLean's argument, but they're, they're talking about a truck that was found with stuff in it. We have a, that was not right. found I, in I there. Don't wanna, I don't want to argue it now, but I just want to let you know the framework that, that I'm interested in hearing some information about the, the point that I raised. All I'll right. Let you argue about it if you want to. I, but just to finish, also, there's the third prong, which would be the disproportionality um, is, is that something that absolutely must be taken into consideration. I understand that. Ms. Rigg, anything that you want to Well, Your Honor, um, I don't think you've heard much from Ms. McLean over the course of the, the case, and um, I want you to be aware that um, she's a former policeman. She was injured on, in duty and got a settlement. And from the settlement, she decided to put her money to work, Bank of Mommy. She bought a pickup truck, two pickup trucks, and her sons were making payments to her for pleasure of using the trucks. Um, she also used the truck. She kept it insured. Um, I believe she kept it registered. Um, or she's on the registration. I'm not even sure the son is. She kept it licensed. Um, obviously, um, being a former policeman, she wasn't stupid enough to say, okay, was well, my son selling drugs today to Mr. Fagan? I mean, that's over the top, unbelievable. But assuming that his second statement, I thought you told me you weren't doing this anymore, is correct? Then, I mean, that would be conclusive from the Commonwealth proof that she didn't know he was up to mischief or bad activities in, in, in the vehicle. 
Um, but you'll hear from her today. I just wanted you to understand where she's coming from here, Your Honor. He was making payments to her. He had that first payment in his hand, in his pocket, when he was arrested. But we're not asking about the money. She just wants the truck back. She gets it back. I believe her intention is to sell it and pay a bunch of lawyer fees. So. All right. Mr. Atkins. Uh, Commonwealth Calls, Agent Fagan. Mr. Ross, from Chester, we're about to give you the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I did. Where you work at and what you do? Tim Fagan, I'm the director of the Buffalo Trace Gateway Narcotics Task Force. And uh, understanding is that you were involved in the, the drug, a controlled drug buy that occurred back on June the 9th of 2008. That's correct. And um, I know that you've already testified about this during the course of the trial that we had here recently. Let me hand you what's been marked as Commonwealth's exhibit number one for identification and ask if you recognize that. Yes, it's a copy of five $20 bills that I copied prior to a controlled drug buy on 6-9 uh, of 08 at 14-15 uh, hours. Is that a true or correct copy? Yes, it is. We ask for admission of Commonwealth 1. Okay. Is there a copy of this also admitted previously in the trial? It was, Your Honor. Now, during the course of, uh, of that controlled drug transaction, um, and I know that you weren't allowed to testify about this during the trial, but was your, what was your understanding about where the drug was coming from? The cooperating witness had uh, told me that uh, he, she was going to actually hand-to-hand -hand purchase it from Christina Kemador and or uh, a male she only knew as Corey at the time. Uh, but she was aware that the uh, pill would have to be delivered to the house and a phone call that occurred prior to the buy led us to believe that the pill was going to have to be delivered by Joey and your she objection your honor this is this is exactly what we had talked about at the beginning of this we've heard all this testimony under oath previously so as far as how he set up the buy who the undercover informant was who she said gave it to her which slightly changed, but we've heard all of that. So I don't think this is necessary. I think it would be time consuming, and I don't think it's going to get to the point, which is, um, I think, basically after the stop. Um, I'll let you get to the essence of it. Yes, Again, Your Honor. I don't want to go for two days, but yes, Your Honor. I think it's important to get out. And uh, based upon the, uh, in the telephone call, the name Joy, uh, did the cooperating witness indicate to you she knew who Joey was? She was familiar with him as Joey Osborne and uh, described what he would be driving. And what kind of vehicle was it? She had a red four-wheel drive. And uh, during the course of the controlled drug buy, did you see that vehicle? Yes, I did. Now, you uh, recovered the Oxy uh, 80 from Miss uh, Morgan. Miss Morgan. Yes. Uh, after that, you went you arranged for a, uh, a traffic stop. That's correct. If it was possible. If it was possible. And they did make a traffic stop. We needed to ID him. We wasn't positive on who it was that was driving the vehicle. Okay. And during the course of that, uh, did you happen to go onto the scene? Yes. After I cleared with the cooperating witness, I went to the scene. Uh, they already had the occupants out. And uh, Sheriff Boggs advised me there had been consent given to search the vehicle. And my understanding is that you saw a billfold on the seat of the vehicle? That's correct. 
And uh, could you identify whose billfold that was? I believe there was some information that it belonged to Mr. Osborne. And did you check the billfold for either uh, uh, money, drugs, things of that sort? Yes. And what did you find inside? Found uh, five hundred and I believe thirty-two dollars in the wallet. And after checking serial numbers, comparing it to my copied money, I found the hundred dollars that was used in the purchase approximately fifteen minutes earlier. And my understanding is there was also a a uh, piece of a uh, hose clamp that yes. was in the building. Yes. Now, at that point, uh, or sometime shortly thereafter. Uh, did you have an opportunity to, to talk to Mr. Osborne? Yes, I did. I advised him of his Miranda rights and asked him where he'd been, and he said he'd been to visit a friend. And uh, I said, I know, I know you visited a friend. I said, you visited Corey, didn't you? And he advised, yes. And I said, you took him a pill. You, you delivered some pills to him, didn't you? And he admitted to that. And did he say anything about money? And he said he had taken, he had accepted money for it also. Did he make any other statements to you? I asked him who, uh, who his supplier was, and that's when he asked for uh, an attorney. At that point, questioning ended? That's correct. Was he placed into custody? Yes, and I told him that we were seizing his vehicle, and it was going to be subject to forfeiture. Now, during the course of all this, was there, uh, did you or law enforcement officers make some sort of arrangement to get the vehicle towed? Yes, the sheriff's department had called for a wrecker. Uh, as we were waiting for the wrecker, uh, it, it arrived on scene and started to load the vehicle. Was it a rollback or a? Rollback. Okay. And uh, did anybody else arrive on the scene? Yes, Miss McLean showed up. Uh, I remember her vaguely from when she was at the Aberdeen Police Department. Or she did introduce herself as being former Aberdeen officer. Okay. So she identified who she was? Yes. And that uh, she wanted you to know that she was a former police officer? Yes. Okay. Did she say anything to her son? She said she asked me first, what, what's, he, what's he being arrested for? And I said, trafficking. And she asked what? And I said, Oxycontin. And that's when she, he was sitting in the back of uh, Deputy Hall's vehicle and the window was down about that much and uh, she looked at him and she said I, I thought you told me you weren't doing this anymore and she pointed to the uh, vehicle on the back of the truck on the back of the wrecker and said there's seventeen fucking thousand dollars getting ready to be towed off. Uh, was she uh, in your opinion if you could form an opinion on this was she uh, calm or upset? Very upset. My understanding is that you uh, also took a look inside the vehicle and uh, discovered this Commonwealth Exhibit Number Two for identification. That's correct. What is that? It is a uh, certificate of title out of the state of Ohio for the vehicle. Uh, and is a, a true and accurate copy, to the best of your knowledge. Yes, it is. We ask for permission of Commonwealth Two. Mm -hmm. the objection. Without no objection. Let me hand you what I've marked as Commonwealth Exhibit Number Three for identification, and ask if you recognize that, sir. Yes, it's a uh, a link ran uh, generation of the registration ran by the Maysville Police Department uh, this morning. Okay. And that's a registration as of back in uh, 2008. Yes, it's been expired for that long. For that long, at least. And uh, is that a, a true and accurate copy? That's yes. We ask for admission of Commonwealth three. No objection. No objection. Now, my understanding is that you also, in the course of uh, the uh, traffic stop, seized a cell phone. Yes. And uh, it was a Samsung cell phone. I believe as it was, I understand. Yes. Uh, did you take a look at the cell phone? Yes, I did. Uh, did you see if there had been any? recent calls made to that cell phone? Yes, there was a um, highlight on the call log it showed a name of Corey and I went into the phone and pulled that number up and it was the same number that had been used to contact the cooperating witness prior to the transaction. Uh, 
And could you tell uh, how soon in time it was from that transaction? Probably half hour prior to me finding the phone. Okay. Thank you. Past witness. Auto. Mr. Fagan testified under oath a number of times about this alleged statement that Mr. Osborne made to you at the scene. Isn't that correct? Yes. And today's story is that you said to him, um, you went to see Corey, and he said yes. And then you said to him, and you gave him some pills, in the plural, and he said yes. Yes, I did. I wasn't sure how many pills he'd delivered to them. Okay. But previously, under oath, your story was different. Oh. In that, well, I'm going to remind you of this, and, and even at trial here, which was a week ago, you stated that he volunteered. He told me he had been to see a friend and that he had brought a pill or he had brought an oxycodone. I stated he admitted to bringing the pill and he admitted to getting the money. Agent Fagan, yes or no? What you just said here today, the I said Corey, I said pills, and his response was a yes. That is not what you said at trial a week ago, is it? I said he admitted to it. Yes, I did. But you didn't use, you didn't say the statement. You did not say what you said today. You said he admitted you had a conversation. You didn't say what you said today about that you said Corey and that you said pills. Yes or no? I didn't say it the other day, no, but he did admit it. And at a preliminary hearing, you did not say anything about I said you went to see Corey and then you delivered pills, did you? I don't recall. At grand jury testimony, you didn't say I told him you went to see Corey and you say, gave him some pills and he said yes. I said he admitted it, yes. What you said, if you can recall, and I'm asking if you can recall this, you said he volunteered this information. You asked him what he was doing and he told you he had gone to see a friend and then he had, yes, he had brought pills to that friend. Yes, or a pill. It. He admitted it, yes. So this is a different twist on the story today that we're hearing? No, ma'am. It's the same story. You just admitted that it wasn't the same story? No, I didn't. Okay. Did you run a Casper report on the passenger in the truck? No, ma'am. Did you run a Casper report on Zach Grayson? I wasn't aware. He would not tell me who was in that vehicle, so I have no clue until this morning when you mentioned his name. I knew the vehicle came back to a Grayson, but I wasn't sure who the occupant of it was. You don't remember telling Mr. Osborne, there goes your buddy Zach, I guess he's getting away. No, ma'am. Oh, okay. And let's see, on the money, what evidence did you present or find that all of the money in Mr. Osborne's wallet were the proceeds traceable to drug transactions? It was just interwound with the money of the buy money. So there's no other evidence that you have regarding the <coughs> remaining, what was it, 532 total? Total, yes. Minus 100, 432 dollars. Um, what do you have to show that that had anything to do with drug transactions of any kind? It was just tied with the money. Okay. And the phone, you didn't present any records, and have you ever pulled any records regarding the phone or no, Christina Kimmeter's phone or Corey Watson's phone? No, ma'am. Okay. And you don't have a tape of a phone conversation between my client and Christina Kimmeter or Corey Watson from this day? No, ma'am, but Corey admitted on the witness stand that he did make a phone call to him to tell him to bring it. But earlier you said it was Christina Kimmeter that made the phone call. She used the phone that was used to call that phone. So, which, so who did it? Who made Christina Kimmeter call? called, called us, but Corey admitted on the witness stand that he made the phone call to Joey. Which is different than the evidence you presented at preliminary hearing that you presented in your report that you presented to the grand jury, and it is different than what you presented to this trial. No, correct? Ma no, ma'am. The fact that Corey Watson came up with a new statement doesn't change what your report initially said, correct? He didn't change anything that he told me that I recall. You've never said that Corey Watson was the individual under oath when you've been testifying on multiple occasions. You never said that Corey Watson was the person who contacted 
Robert Osborne. You have always stated multiple occasions under oath that it was Christina Kimeter who had that conversation with him. Christina Kimeter is the one that said she would have to contact him. She had told him, our cooperating witness over the phone that she would have to call him when she got there. So you're now adjusting this situation based on what Corey Watson said no, on the stand? No, ma'am. I was not there when the phone call was made, so I don't know who made the phone call to Joey. But the phone, the same phone was used that was, we received a phone call in, on Ms. Morgan's phone was the same number that showed up on Mr. Osborne's phone. But whose phone was that? By, the, by Mr. Osborne's log, it was Corey's. By his log, it was Corey's? Mm -hmm. Where are the records for that? It was just that? in the phone, in his phone book. It came up as Corey was called, had called. But we don't know what was said in that conversation? I don't know. Okay. All right. You never, this oxycodone 80, did you ever find anything else? Um, you had to find any other pills? I found the pill cutter with the residue inside the vehicle. The residue did not, we've heard testimony and you were present during that, that it does not match. They are not the same thing. I did not hear that. I heard that it was oxycodone pills. The lab tech testified, you were here. The lab yes. tech testified the residue and the oxycodone 80 were not the same thing. I believe the testimony I heard that the oxycodone that was in the pill cutter was not the same as what was prescribed to Mr. Osborne. And also not the pill. Are you saying that the we, lab we tech testified no, they the were pill, the same thing? Because the pill was in whole portion, so it wasn't a part of that pill, no. Okay, but your testimony today is that there was more than one pill. Yes, probably. Somewhere in the mix of it, there was some other pill crushed up in that pill cutter. But, but, but that's not the oxycodone 80, which was your um, controlled, as, as controlled as it was, by, correct? No, because that pill was whole and complete. So, you just said here today that you believed other pills were delivered. You've expanded your story and said other pills have been delivered on this day. I didn't know. I didn't know how many Mr. Watson got because I didn't have Mr. Watson in front of me telling me how many he got at the okay. time. You didn't do a search of the Kim and Watson house, no. did you? They were provided a police ride home. Right? I'm not aware of that part of it, no. You testified to that previously? No, ma'am, I did not. At the preliminary hearing? I did not testify to that. Okay. I was not at that traffic stop. I have no recollection of what other than I know that Mr. Davis was arrested for a DUI. Well, let's forget the traffic stop. You were in charge of a um, undercover operation targeting Christina Kimeter and Corey Watson. At the beginning of the day, that was your target, yes? Correct. Okay. So your target were returned home, no search of the house, no statements taken from them, but today you're saying that you believe and have believed that there were more drugs. Wasn't sure. Do you um, finger test the money for fingerprints or anything for fingerprints? No, ma'am. Nothing further. Rick, any questions? Thank you. Um, if you could just... Uh, reiterate your knowledge of when Jewel Osborne McLean she, up she pulled scene. up in another vehicle behind uh, I believe Deputy Hall's vehicle and, and showed at that up. point where was Joey he was in the back of a cruiser already locked in a cruiser yes okay she pulled in and she pulled in and came up to the scene and said uh, I think she first off said that she was his mother and then she she did briefly say or do you remember me I worked in Aberdeen she addressed you first not Mr. Hall I think Mr. Hull was sitting in the vehicle at okay. the time. And, and, and said, do you remember me? And I, I remembered her vaguely. Uh, and uh, she asked what, what he was being charged with, and I told her the trafficking charge. And she said, trafficking what? And I told him Oxycontin, or told her Oxycontin. And that's when she immediately turned her attention to Mr. Osborne. And you were standing right outside yes. of the sheriff's car? Yes. And uh, she also, she said, uh, I thought you told me you weren't doing this anymore. And then she pointed towards the truck and said, there's 17 effing thousand dollars on the back of that record. Okay. Any other profanity or violence? That was the only one. She was upset and I understood her to be upset. 
I think she did add that she had sent him to rehab for the same problem. For, for trafficking or for, for using? drugs? For drugs. Okay. So, are, 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 you're telling me that Jewel thought her son was not using drugs anymore? She, she had it in her mind that he wasn't, I guess. And she was upset and she was vehement that he's not using drugs anymore. He told me he's not using. I thought you told me I'm not using. That's correct. So she was convinced in her brain that he wasn't using drugs anymore. I, by her statement, that's what I took it as. So did you have a long talk about rehab and all that? I no, ma'am. seen short talk about no, it? Or? I think she just brought it up. And I'm not even sure she brought it up to me. She might have brought it up to one of the other officers. I'm not sure. Have you ever spoken with her outside of uh, this situation? Mm. I don't recall if I did, no. You mean since the incident? Even before the incident. I might have talked to her one time, but I don't think it was anything but about no that. no particular personal knowledge of no, her or her circumstances no, or family or children? No, ma'am. Anything like that. Okay. You have children? Yes. Do you ever? Well, I don't have children myself or stepchildren. You're involved in family situation. Yes. Um, you ever heard of the Bank of Mommy? I mean, have you ever bought things and let the kids make payments back for, for things? I have a child that abuses drugs, and I would not give her anything like that. Okay. That so would be enabling her. It, it doesn't apply in your family? Well, she's where she needs to be, let's put it that way. Do, um, As far as the, um, the um, registration of the title on, on the vehicle, yes, it, it's in both names? It's in both names. And whose name's listed first? I believe her name might be on the first of it. Okay. Do you know when the um, uh, title registration expires? Oh, I believe it expired in 08 sometime. Do you remember I, what month it was? Whose birthday it might have been? You'd have to look at the registration. I didn't look at that close. Did you bring the actual registration or just that one? No, I could not find it, it in the vehicle. You couldn't find it? In the vehicle it wasn't. I'll note for the, the record, the, title was the license it. expires 11-08. Uh, I don't think the registration expires. I think just the license expires on the vehicle, if I'm not mistaken. But the Whatever license. you get renewed, it's in, in November. Um, and transfer issued, it says transfer issued. 5-08, which obviously is May of 08. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, what about the insurance on the vehicle? There was an insurance card in the vehicle. And whose name was the insurance? I believe it had Jewel's name on it. And um, you don't believe she was actually peddling drugs in the, in the vehicle? or? She wasn't in the vehicle, so. And she told you she didn't know. I don't. I don't know how she ended up on the scene unless somebody was listening to a scanner or something. Because she showed up almost instantaneously, and I don't think he made a phone call to her. I definitely don't see a log that he made a phone call to her. Wasn't there a second vehicle involved, and they were stopped? There was another there vehicle, but we never ID'd who was in it. And then this Grayson fella got away, and. I, I, there was a brief conversation between the, the Jeep and, and Mr. Osborne's vehicle, but there was no physical contact. They were pulled up beside each other, but nobody handed anything anywhere. And I don't believe that came back to a Zach Grayson. I believe it came back to an Andrew Grayson or something, the tag we ran. Thank you. Any other questions? Any follow-up? Um, <clears throat> I know that you weren't present during that conversation and things that happened inside of the vehicle uh, of Mr. Osborne when Corey Watson 
no. was in it. Was not. Uh, but you heard what Corey Watson testified to. That's correct. Um, Your Honor, we have Commonwealth Exhibit Number Four for demarcation, and we'd ask for admission of this. This is the innocent owner affidavit done by Miss uh, McLean with the attachments that is in the record or should be in the record. Have you all seen this or any objection? I've seen it. No, I've shown it to them. Without objection. Pass witness. Any follow-up? Agent Fagan, in regards to Zach Grayson, that chief didn't belong to any Grayson. Isn't that true? I was thinking it came back to uh, Andrew Grayson, but uh, I don't have any of the documents in front of me. Actually, that chief was owned by Mr. Grayson's girlfriend, whose last name is not Grayson. Oh, I'm not sure who it was then. I, I just know that it was told to me later on that it came back to Grayson. Oh, it was told to you later on. I, that I didn't. Came back I to didn't ever get the tag off of it. Somebody else did, <coughs> or they might have known it personally. I'm not sure what. Anything else? No, Your Honor. You may stand aside. Thank you. Any other witnesses? No, Your Honor. Is Lisa Sod on? I have no witnesses, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'd like to put Ms. McLean on, but could we have like five minutes? Sure, we'll take a five minute break. Thank My name is Jewel McLean. I live at 1710 Flocker Hill Road, Lot 53, Aberdeen, Ohio. And you're related to the defendant? Yes, ma'am. It's my son. And you sat through the trial last week, and you know why we're here. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, it's my understanding about a year ago you filed some papers with the court, if I may see the exhibit, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. I believe it was in October of 09. Okay. Yes, ma'am. To, uh, you want to tell us what uh, your attempt to do there last October, November was? Um, I was attempting to retrieve my pickup truck that had been impounded uh, back in 08. Um, and you had some documents attached. Will you tell us what's attached? Um, the attachment is from Dotson Brothers in Paris where I purchased the truck. Um, it's a... Uh, Melissa was, uh, she did an out-of-state processing for me, and it's a, that's that form, and then the uh, application for the certificate of title and registration. And whose names are on that application for certificate of title? Uh, my name's first because I was the purchaser. Um, I had bought these trucks one day prior to leaving for Florida, um, and I put Robert's name on it so he could do any title work or tag work that may be done in my absence because I had no idea how long I was going to be gone okay. at that time. Um, any other documents attached there? Uh, yes, ma'am. There's another document and it's just a payment copy regarding uh, the 05 and 06 Dodge that I purchased. It's a fax that Melissa had sent me. Um, confirming that it was my check from uh, Ripley Federal Savings Bank taken out of my savings account on uh, April the... Uh, Is that a copy of a check? Yes, ma'am. What's the amount of the check? The amount was $35,745.40. Okay. And that's all the exhibits there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, you said you put Robert's name on this particular truck? Yes, ma'am. Um, I had an agreement with him that I told him that when I came back from Florida, I was going to give him X amount of time to get himself established because he was shoeing horses, um, getting his business together. 
um, he needed a truck in order to do that. So I told him that he could use the truck in my absence for shoeing purposes. His equipment was kept in that truck. And when I came back from Florida that I expected his first truck payment to be made to me within two weeks of me returning. And in fact, uh, how much was the payment supposed to be? $350 a month. 300 towards the truck, 50 for insurance. Okay. Which brings me to the next question. I have an exhibit here. Could you tell us what that is? This is actually the second policy from Grange. The first one was through Geico that I obtained when I purchased the trucks. Um, they, are, they were to be remain in my name until they were paid off. I kept full coverage insurance on them in case of an accident, so I would be in, reimbursed for the purchase price. So who is the insured person on the 2006 Dodge? Myself. Okay. And I've Is it marked? Yes, sir, I marked it. What's the it's exhibit number? One for me. One. Uh, I'm gonna put JM exhibit one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um copy of a bank statement. This is a copy of my savings account statement for the month of April thirtieth of 08 and there is a withdrawal amount on April 10th for a cashier's check in the amount of $35,745.40. And does that correspond with the amount that you paid for uh, Dotson Brothers for two pickup trucks back? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is it? JM2, I'm sorry. I'm moving to have been submitted. Yes, sir, I'm going to move it. Motion to admit exhibit JM1, JM2, and the objection. No objection. I got well. No objection. And is that another uh, document from the purchase? Yes, it's the odometer disclosure statement. How many miles are on the truck? 18,941 on the day of purchase. Okay. So was it previously owned? Yes, it was used. Point, assuming it's it's set for two and a half years, it's still very low miles. I'm assuming I haven't been yeah. allowed to look at the mileage. Okay. Um, you, at some point, did you have access to go out and um, your son to clear out his tools? Yes, ma'am. I petitioned the court um, for removal of his horseshoeing uh, tools so he could try to continue to horseshoe um, in the event of everything that's happened. And did you accompany your son when he went out there to um, get Actually, I was there first and spoke with Tim prior to... Uh, Tim being Fagan? Yes, Agent Fagan, uh, okay. prior to Joey's arrival. Okay. Did you look around for the title and yes. registration? It had been removed. The title and registration were both in the glove compartment. Okay. Well, let's get to the meat of the matter here. What was Joey doing in the truck that day? He had called me and told me that he was on his way to my house with his first truck payment because I had just gotten back from Florida on June 5th. I flew in. And uh, was he planning to bring anything to your house? Yeah, he was bringing the truck because the Cadillac that he normally drove was sitting there. Okay. Did he stop to pick up dinner? I think he said he was going to Arby's before he came over. Anything out of the ordinary about that conversation? Now he called me. I hadn't, I had not seen him since I'd returned from Florida on the fifth. I so it had him. been a month or more. Since I left for Florida uh, April the eleventh and came back June fifth. So um, you're looking forward to seeing him? Oh, of course. He'd been doing really well. He was had his own apartment and was working every day. And he called me quite often while I was in Florida and vice versa. So again, did you have any reason to believe that he was out uh, committing felonies or peddling drugs in the truck? No, ma'am. I had no idea. Okay. 
Um, how did you learn about, how did you come to be out there at the location where the truck was pulled over? Well, since he called me and told me that he was coming over to the house, actually, I was, you know, waiting on him to get there. And um, Zachary Grayson had came to the house and he told me that the police had had Joey stopped over by the New Bridge Access Road. And I got in uh, my other vehicle that someone had driven back to Florida, from Florida to me. And I went over there and I pulled up behind um, Deputy Hull. I did not know it was Deputy Hall at the time, but I pulled up behind. And uh, Tim walked up to me, actually, before I even got up to Hull's cruiser. And he said, hey, Joel, what can I do for you? He called you by your first name. Yes, ma'am, he sure did. Um, I've known Agent Fagan for years. Tell the court about your prior employment background. And I worked with the Aberdeen Police Department as an auxiliary in 96 and was hired full-time in 97 and continued my employment with them until my accident in 2004 um, as a police officer. And that accident was... Uh, I was dragged by a car on a traffic stop. That would be Ruthie Turner situation. Yes, then she crossed the bridge and got more trouble yes, in Kentucky. Okay. Um, Tim actually walked up to me. And he said, Joel, what can I do for you? And I said, that's my truck on that rollback. And his words to me was, not anymore, it's mine. You can buy it back at auction. And I proceeded to get a little upset with him. And I said, that's where you're wrong. Evidently, you don't think that I know the law. And I said, what did he do? And he says, he's under arrest for drug trafficking. And I said, what did you catch him with? He said, nothing. No, I said, what, what, what do you have on him? He said, nothing. Marked money. He walked me over to a blazer, a burgundy blazer. He opened uh, the blazer door and pulled out two pieces of white paper that had $20 bills on them, front and back, copy, two pieces. And he reached in his right-hand side pocket, and he pulled out 20s. And he said, this is what I caught your boy with, and it matches these. And I asked him, I was like, why are they in your pocket if that's what you caught him with? And he put it back in his pocket, laid the papers down in, in his blazer, and I said, can I talk to him? And he said yes. Well, hold that thought here. So when he reached in his pocket and pulled out the 20s, they were in an evidence bag, right? No, ma'am, they were not. They were wrapped in a little cellophane. They were? No, they were just uh, 20s folded up in half, stuck in his right-hand side pocket. In a little envelope? No. But he said that he got them from Robert, so... Yeah, he did. Okay, that's what he said. Um, but you weren't there. You just saw him later when he pulled him out of his pocket. Yeah, we, we actually had about a 10-minute conversation prior to me speaking to Robert. I did ask him for, me, for permission to speak with him. Okay. And he did accompany me to the back of Darren Hall's cruiser. Where you spoke with your son? Yes, he was handcuffed in the back seat. Did you use the, the F word? Um, probably. I'm not, I can't say for sure, but honestly, I'm not proud to admit it, but I probably use that word a lot more than I should to this you day. You were real upset? Well, of course, my son's sitting in the back of a police cruiser handcuffed. Okay. And what were your words to him? Um, Robert's had a drug issue ever since he was 13. He had his, he lost it, a cornea. He lost his, almost lost his whole entire eye. Um, that started his addiction to drugs. And he had been clean. I know that because he was living with me um, up until the time that he got his apartment. But like I said, I was gone in Florida for three months. So I was unaware that he was using. And my statement to him was what Mr. Fagan said, was I thought you weren't doing this anymore, using drugs. How long um, did he in fact go to rehab? at some point. He'd never been to rehab because, um, <laughs> well, before I got my settlement, I couldn't afford it, but um, he was sent to, I can't remember the name of it, it was in Springfield, Ohio. I had filed charges on him myself through juvenile court in Brown County for being unruly. And by unruly, I meant defiant, mouthy, not doing what he's supposed to do, not going to school. and. I looked at the Judge Clark up there and I begged her 
to do something with them because I couldn't do anything with them. And she sent him there. And he was in Springfield for, I'm going to say, almost a year. And when he was there, he excelled in school. He made the President's List um, National Honor Society. He did wonderfully. But being a mom, I wanted my kid home. So after they thought that he had improved enough, he came home. Okay. And from that point, were there continuing problems, or did he behave pretty well? He was pretty much okay. Um, I could tolerate him. Um, and I'm a pretty patient person, actually. Um, he worked. He was a good worker. He, he's a very hard worker. Um, whether or not he was abusing drugs, if he did, he was doing a damn good job hiding it because I've had plenty of experience with drug addicts and drug abusers. Oh, my next question, as a mother and a former police officer trained in detecting things out of, like that, did you have any reason to think that at the time you left for Florida in April and then when you returned in June, did you see or hear or observe anything leading you to believe that he was using, abusing, Absolutely or not. Get I would have. In drugs. I would have never made the agreement that we made for the truck if I ever thought that he was using drugs again and definitely not selling drugs. Period. I would have never agreed to it. Never done it. Nothing. Did you see any indication of excess phone calls, people coming and going? Well, I wasn't here for three months, but um, no, he called me regularly. We spoke, because uh, I actually lived in Maysville for a few months prior to going to Florida. I still have a residence in Ohio, but I had a residence over here also. Um, and he was, he was at least at my house two or three times a week when I lived out on Seddon Lane off of Stone Lake. And he was fine. He was clear-eyed. He was working. He was... You know, he had a family. He had a girlfriend with a child. He was doing good. His child? Not his child, her child. But he was doing very good. And that was part of the reason for it. You know, I was trying to give him an opportunity that I did not have at his age, which was to set up his own business and make, him, make something of himself. Okay. Um. I, I, I omitted something on the drop, the expiration, uh, on the registration. Or yes, the type. When, when's your red truck? When's that get renewed, the tags over in Ohio? They were supposed to be renewed November 20th of 08 for the following year. That's my birthday. Okay. And, and they do that according to the month of your birthday. When's Joey's birthday? Unlike Kentucky, when your tags expire, they expire. Um, my, they go on my birthday. All right. When's his birthday? January 13th. But it, this was registered to, to expire in your yes. your birth month. Okay. Have you gone and re-registered? No. <laughs> no. I'm not going to re-register a truck I can't drive. Okay. Got it. Um, now, just to clarify, tell us again the, the arrangement, the contract, the deal you and your son had about buying the truck. You bought two trucks. I bought two trucks, yes. Um, I bought those as kind of like an investment type thing because I, was, I didn't have any money coming in. Yes, I did have money in the bank. However, they didn't have any credit established. I advised them that I would buy the pickup trucks, that I would keep them in my name up until the time that they were paid for. Then I would take my name off the title and put them only in their name. They agreed both to pay me $350 a month for X amount of months, and I never got my first payment from Joe. from Joey. What about your other son? Yes. I'm getting payments from my other son to this day. His truck's older. Um, he was out without a job for a while, so his payments did stop, but he is working again now, and his payments have since restarted. Okay. And the deal was that I kept the insurance on it. That way I knew it was paid. And if anybody had an accident or the trucks were totaled, 
the check would come to me and I would be reimbursed for my investment. Okay. They'll have some more questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going to move to introduce that, the, the exhibits. So. Right. Thank you. Mr. So, oh, ma'am, when did you go to Florida? Um, April the 11th of 08. After the truck was uh, was purchased? The day after, yes. The day after. I see those uh, exhibits of the Commonwealth, Your Honor. And the defense. Show you come well, uh, defense exhibit uh, three that you've uh, just introduced through. Uh, is that your signature or his signature? The which one, sir? Above your name. Well, obviously it's his signature. Okay, your name is not on here. Um, my signature is not on there. My name's on there twice. Oh. But your your signature is not on it. No. Okay. But you were there. Yes, sir. Okay. And back in April, you bought a, a 2005 and a 2006 Dodge pickup trucks? Yes, sir. And right after you bought the trucks, you left to Florida? Yes, sir. I flew. So you're not aware of what the mileage was or how much mileage had been used by your son, Joey, between the time that you left and when you returned? Can, could you? You don't know how much miles he put on it. Uh, I, drove, I had driven it a couple of times in between. I came back. Let me, can I clarify something? I did come back in May for surgery. Um, I came back in May and I had surgery and I left immediately the next day and was taken back to Florida. And he had driven the truck maybe two or three times in between April and May, I'm assuming, per our phone conversations. Um, but he was driving it for his shoeing business when I came back in June. Uh, but you're not aware of how much miles that he was putting on? Not exactly, no. I didn't ask him to keep a record of that. So from April till sometime in May, he, according to him, he'd operated that truck about uh, two or three times. I don't know exactly how many times, but we talked like every other day on the phone. So I was keeping close tabs on him and his brother. From Florida? Well, yeah. They're my kids. I talked to them at least three four times a week. Now, this uh, agreement that you had with uh, the defendant, was that uh, a written contract? No, sir. It was not? No, sir. So we don't have anything in writing about these uh, payments that were supposed to be made from him to you? No, sir. Was Joey's name on both of the vehicles? No, sir. Just on the one? Yes, sir. Now, your address is, uh, is also P.O. Box 406. Is that correct? No, sir. It is not? No, sir.
Uh, what is your address? 1710 Flocker Hill, Lot 53, Aberdeen. So you don't use P.O. Box 406 for anything? No, sir, haven't for probably 11 months. Okay. So, but it was back in uh, uh, April or so of 2008 when you bought the vehicle? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Was it also your address back in October of uh, 2009 when you asked the court for your vehicle back? Mailing purposes only. Okay. So it's still a, an address that you use? Not th not now, no. I, was, I did away with it. But it was back in October? Uh, possibly. I'd have to look and ask the post office for sure. But okay. So possibly. if it was on the documents? If it was on the documents in September or October, whenever I filed, yes, at that time, yes. Okay. And you would not file anything with the court uh, between then and now to give any kind of update on your address? Um, it, does it count when you sign in and out of the jail when you had to put your address down? Every with, time with the court know. file here is what I'm talking about. I haven't filed anything with the okay. court since then. When did your son get out of this program in Springfield, Ohio? I'm not sure of the date, sir. Um, he was he was young then. It was he was still a juvenile. How old is he now? Um, twenty-three. And when did he graduate from high school? He attained his GED within two weeks of being an MCDC, thanks to Miss Marie Henderson. And well, when did he leave school in Ohio? Uh, I'm not sure. I think he quit school two months prior to graduating after his 18th birthday. And when would that have been? Uh, two months prior to his 18th birthday. Um, I can't give you an exact date. Well, what year was that? Uh, I don't know. When was he 18? He's 23 now, so it's five years ago. And what was your son doing uh, between then and when he got arrested? Uh, most of the time he was living with my oldest son, who is the lead instructor at the Kentucky Horseshoeing School, and he was working there and being um, taught the profession of horseshoeing. And was he actually working as a uh, farrier? Yes, sir, he was. Where at? Uh, where, when? I, I'm not understanding oh, the question. When are you aware of him working as a farrier? It, Back when he... When he was living with his Between high school and <coughs> June of 2008. Well, he worked in Virginia when he was living with my son there as a farrier, and after my son had taken the job with the Kentucky Horseshoeing School, he was there also in Shelbyville and in Richmond. Was he working on his own or for someone? Um, right after his arrest, when he could no long he lost clients because of this, um, he could no longer work on his own because he didn't have a truck. So he was working with Jared Moran, who is a farrier out of Georgetown, Ohio. Before this, before he, he got arrested? He was working on his own. And we're at? Uh, wherever he had clients, mostly over here in Kentucky. But you're not aware of any specific places? I'm aware of specific people. Who? Um, well, Deb Pinger of West Fork Farms in Georgetown, Ohio. I can't remember the gentleman's name. You would have to ask Robert. He owns some very expensive high-dollar show mules here in, um, I think it's Mason County. Could be Fleming. I'm not real sure. But uh, he also got his name published in a farrier's magazine because that man mentioned him, stating he was the reason that his mules did so well. Now, before you bought him this vehicle, what was he operating with? He had a Cadillac Katerra that he had purchased himself. Um, and I have another pickup truck. When he needed to shoe horses, he would take my gray pickup truck, and I would drive the Katerra <coughs> up until the time that he got the red truck. How long were you a police officer over at uh, Aberdeen? 
I started in September of 1997. Um, I did leave once to take a job with the, the Department of Children and Family Services as a criminal investigator, but then I returned back to the Aberdeen Police Department and I was there up until October 28, 2004 when I was injured on duty. So how many years in law enforcement did you have in either working as an investigator for the cabinet uh, for social services or working as a, a law enforcement officer? Well, I started as an auxiliary officer in 96 and was injured in 2004. So roughly eight years on duty. Did you ever have uh, uh, involvement with cases involving drugs? Absolutely. Uh, did you ever have involvement with cases where people were selling drugs? Absolutely. In your experience, did you ever have uh, contact with folks that uh, didn't have to abuse drugs to sell them? They didn't abuse drugs, but they sold them. Um, I'm not aware of that. Most okay. most um, of the cases that we did were like buy and bust or um, lengthy investigations such as the task force does. You were upset on the day that uh, this occurred? I'm sorry, sir? You were upset, uh, upset on the day that this occurred, June the 9th of 2008? Upset of, could you clear, Were you upset when yourself? you went to the scene? When I went to the day? scene? No, I wasn't upset when I went to the scene, no. Okay. Why did you go to the scene? Uh, probably because I wanted to know what was going on with my vehicle and my son. Okay, and you said that this Zach person had come by your place and said that there had been a traffic stop. Oh, yes. Uh, um, Tim mentioned Mr. Grayson to me also on the traffic stop. Mr. Grayson apparently came to your place? Yes, sir, he did. And told you that there was a traffic stop? Yes, sir, he did. Is that how you knew that there was a traffic stop? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, why did you go from where you were living at to the shoulder of the road where this traffic stop occurred? Well, I wanted to know what was going on with my son, but I was under the impression that I would probably have to drive my vehicle home. I don't, I don't understand why. Uh, because they because said that they were arresting, stop? they had arrested my son. When you're under arrest, they normally don't unarrest you and let you leave. That was information that uh, this uh, Grayson person told you? Absolutely. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out why you went from your residence to, to that location. Because I had a truck and a child there. Did you tell your son I didn't think you were doing this anymore? Did I tell my son? Mm -hmm. I made the statement. Did you say that to your son that day? I think I already stated that I said that, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Lugansato. I have no questions. Where are you for a couple of follow-ups, Your Honor. How far is it from Flock Rail Road to the, new, the top? That, where the traffic stop was? Uh, well, if anyone in the court is familiar with the Aberdeen Bowling Alley, I live directly behind the bowling alley, so maybe, what, two, three miles tops, if that? Less than five minutes. Absolutely. You're not a party to this case as far as you're not a defendant or anything, right? No, I'm just hit financially. Okay. But your son was on some kind of special monitor bond. No, when he bond. was first arrested, his bond was $10,000 cash, no surety. Um, I was hesitant to put up that amount due to my financial situation. Um, they, they eventually lowered it to $5,000 cash, which was a little bit more comfortable for me. And then I was um, asked to sign an additional $2,500 surety bond. When he got back, and then he was on monitored release with Ms. Garrett. Absolutely, he was with Darlene Garrett, yes. And Darlene knew he lived at your home. Um, we actually petitioned the court um, 
and, I, and if I'm correct in staying so, if I remember correctly, Judge Wood, um, he had lost, Robert had lost a lot of business after his arrest. Um, he was no longer able to pay his rent. Um, I paid it for a month after his arrest. Um, he didn't have any place else to go. We petitioned the court to see if he was allowed to come across the river and stay with me during the course of all the investigation in the trial. And they were given the physical address of where he would be. Darlene was aware. She had the phone number. Yes, ma'am. Aberdeen Post Office. How many people live in Aberdeen? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the census is. I really don't keep up with it since I'm not an active police officer there anymore. Um, but there is very little limited mail delivery. You're required to have a post office box. Um, myself always carried a post office box because I was a police officer and where I live our mailboxes are exposed to a regular road that you cannot see. So. <clears throat> but it became financially hard for me to pay that money, that kind of money for a post office box. So that's why I did away with it this year. You for know the postmaster, mistress? Harriet Dotson, yes ma'am. Okay. And what's the protocol if there's mail delivered up there and say certified letter comes to the post office box? And if this, this is important if she's... All that was for was for the Commonwealth to say that they gave notice oh, okay. to the last of arrest, but if she's not objecting to All right. All right. And then the day you bought the, the two pickup trucks, did you have a lot of papers to sign? Yes. You were present. You signed the rest of the papers. You signed the application for titles and all that? Yes, ma'am. I forgot to ask you that you really won't think it's important the judge knows. Um, if I may just say that I just don't think it's fair that I should have to pay for something that that they're saying somebody else did. Why should I have to be held financially responsible for someone else's? Did you? I'm going to use indiscretion for lack of a better term. Did you use the truck? Yes, ma'am, I did. How, how many times did you drive it? in the what, two months that well I was gone for you know off and on but um, that was actually the color of the truck that I wanted when I bought mine so yeah I was rather fond of that truck um, I drove it from the time that I bought it till the time that I came back probably three four times maybe something like that that truck had cloth seats um, it was actually easier on my back. Where did it stay parked? At, at my residence at Flocker Hill. Even when he wasn't living there? Yes, ma'am. Um, he had a black Cadillac that was his. An older model little car. That was his car. You mentioned uh, by bus. Now, I'm not sure I understand what that is. I'm sorry? You mentioned a by bus. You don't understand what a by bus is? Can you explain that to me? Isn't that what Agent Fagan did on June 9th? Well, what, can you explain that to me? Or so he says. Um, as a, Doing a by bus, we get uh, officers from other agencies. Um, if we ever use a CI, it's not a paid CI. They're never paid by our department or they weren't when I was there. Um, we also have someone there to search their person. They are then monitored with a wire. There is a police officer always in eyesight of the actual buy and everything is recorded including the officers if they're sitting in the vehicle with the tape recording system that's monitored by the CI. Everything's recorded. Um, as soon as the buy is made, police officers move in to do a bust. However, there are times when we just monitor buys and build up a case, let the person buy several times, build a case, and then 
either hand down an indictment or bust them. Okay. So uh, after a, a, a controlled drug buy with a <coughs> five bust, somebody is then arrested shortly thereafter? When normally it's the people that are actually on tape. That, that the are buy is being made from, or folks that are supplying the drugs? Our, our CIs have to have direct contact with the dealer, period. Uh, so it would be the person who's selling the drugs or the dealer? Yes, we like to get everything on tape. Okay. Uh, were you a part of those? As a buyer? No, as a part of those as an investigator. I have been, yes. Okay. When you did the buy bust and you arrested the dealer, did you find the, the controlled substance that was sold on that dealer or did you find the buy money on that dealer? Well, normally when we did a buy, it just varied depending on who the dealer was, but normally a dealer is going to have more product on them plus buy money, plus buy money and more product. Okay. Your Honor, um, I'm going to object. Is he asking her to be an expert about drug buys or what? I don't understand the relevance. <coughs> <coughs> Now, she's previously testified about drug operations and the like in her experience. Why, why is it important at this hearing? Well, I, I'll go off that, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, in your experience with these type of drug cases in Ohio, if somebody was, was stopped um, and their vehicle was allegedly involved in transportation of drugs, would that vehicle be seized by the Ohio authorities? Oh. I'm going to object, Your Honor. This is, he's asking her about Ohio's policy. We're here in Kentucky today. I'll sustain. Nothing further, Your Honor. Follow up. Yes, sir. You may stand aside. Thanks. Thank you. Any further witnesses? Yes, sir. I don't want to argue it now or you want to submit anything to me? Anything further? Or neither one? Your Honor, I would just simply, I've, I've submitted to you my memorandum. I've attached the case law. If you need um, any of the other case law or if the Commonwealth does, I have them here um, to be submitted. Um, other than that, I would simply make this statement. Even for clear and convincing evidence, there must be some reliability to the evidence given. I believe, based on the changes in stories, based on what has happened over two and a half years, there is no reliability for the evidence that the, com that the Commonwealth has presented. And I would just ask that you please take that into consideration when comparing what they've provided with the case law in this matter. I believe if that is done, there is no reason to forfeit Mr. Osborne's property, uh, whether that's the phone, the cash, or his interest in the truck. Thank you. Ms. Rigg. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as the actual purchaser and uh, one of the title donors of the, the truck, Your Honor, I believe Ms. Osborne uh, McLean. Thank you. Um, is being excessively punished as well. She's not even a party to this suit. Under the uh, 218A410 subsection, uh, at the bottom of the page here, number two, no conveyance is subject to forfeiture under this section. By reason of any act or omission established by the owner thereof to have been committed or omitted without his knowledge or consent. There's no proof that she had any knowledge. And she certainly didn't consent to any behavior about drug abuse or drug trafficking or facilitating drug trafficking in, in, in her truck. Um, under 218A 460, Section 4, uh, her burden is a preponderance to show that uh, the truck shouldn't be subject to forfeiture, I believe, by showing the actual purchase money and the, uh, the titled ownership and the lack of knowledge of uh, any, any current activity, even testified to by the Commonwealth on the scene that she said, I thought you weren't involved in drugs. 
paraphrasing. That was the, 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 the total extent of her knowledge there, Your Honor. And for that reason, I, I, I'd like to see it returned to Ms. Ms. McClain. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Commonwealth believes that the property in question should be forfeited, all of it, with regard to the vehicle. There's nothing that uh, has been presented to this court that would lend the court to really believe that, that Miss uh, McLean was trying to help her son. Uh, she, she certainly was. She was trying to help her son. She provided a vehicle for him while it was titled in both of their names. Insurance was in her name. Uh, we only have her testimony about these payments with regard to payment being made to her. Uh, she was trying to help her son. He was having hard times. He was trying to make a living as a farrier. And for all we know, this could well be a gift to him uh, for her to, to take responsibility for providing transportation to him, for providing insurance for him so that he didn't have out-of-pocket expense so he could work on that farrier profession that he apparently has. I'm going to object. That's kind of misstating. She didn't say it was a gift. I'll let Mark you. So that he could further his own income and further his ability to earn wages. Your Honor, Miss McLean had no control uh, over this vehicle that she provided to her son the defendant in this case. She provided it to him. He made use of it. Uh, she certainly was not here to make sure what he did with that vehicle and how he was earning income, whether it was from being a, a farrier or from trafficking drugs. It is clear from the evidence that this court heard that he brought a Oxycontin 80 to Kentucky and provided it to Corey Watson. I'd ask the court to take a look at, at instruction number six in the jury instructions. This was an instruction that was prepared by his defense counsel. Paragraph A deals with that either he sold to or helped Corey Watson acquire oxycodone without a prescription. I'm going to object. I don't believe it says he sold a pill to Corey Watson. I'm reading from the instruction, Your Honor. That was not submitted to the jury that he sold a pill to him. That was submitted to the jury, Your Honor. And it was changed, Your Honor, after I reviewed it. The facilitation specifically says he helped him to acquire. If that went to the jury saying that he sold it, that's trafficking. And that's what I argued to the jury. Well, you argued it, but, Your Honor, I don't remember s submitting anything that said he sold something. It said he helped him to obtain. Instruction number six, count one. going to object to the characterization that this was submitted to the jury by his defense counsel. These were all negotiated and submitted by you, Your Honor, not by defense counsel. Uh, I have count one instruction number six, A, that in this county on or about June 9, 2008, and before the finding of the indictment here, and he sold to or helped Porter Watson acquire oxycodone without a prescription. Your Honor, that's not what I agreed to when we reviewed jury instructions. I submitted and helped to obtain. I would submit that that was a typo if that went to the jury. I reviewed the instructions with the jury and I didn't say anything about sold. It was helped to obtain. And Your Honor, if I was defense counsel, I would gloss over that too. I'm not glossing over it. I take offense at that. 
I know what I submitted to this court. Facilitation does not say sold or helped to attain. The record speaks for itself. And, Your Honor, based upon the finding by the jury that the defendant was guilty of facilitation, that includes those directions that were submitted to the jury, we believe that the vehicle should be forfeited. With regard to the money, the cash money that was found in his possession, there was some $500 and I think $30-some dollars that was in his possession in his billfold where there was some drug paraphernalia, the hose clamp that was found in his billfold. That $500 and $30-some dollars had in it $100 that was marked bills that had been provided in the drug transaction by Amy Morgan to Corey Watson and Christina Kimeter, which ended up in the possession of the defendant. Your Honor, that money was intermingled, commingled with the money. There's been no testimony, no evidence to this court about where the other $400 and some odd dollars came from. We submit to the court that this is part of the drug trafficking that occurred either on that date or from some other date prior to June the 9th of 2008. The cell phone was used in the course of the drug trafficking. It was the cell phone that had been made contact with by Corey Watson or Christina Kimeter. It had with it contact, according to the call log testified to by Agent Fagan, that showed a call being made. And I think the court can reasonably infer that that call was the call to have the OxyContin 80 brought over to Mason County. For those reasons and the belief that Ms. McClain was aware and suspected that her son was still doing this, involved in trafficking drugs, we'd ask that the court forfeit the vehicle, the cash, and the cell phone. I'll read the cases that have been submitted and get a decision out expeditiously. Mr. Osborne, I'm not sure I told you at the sentencing last time you do have a right to appeal the decision of the jury and have a right to have to file that appeal within 30 days after having been finally sentenced. I would extend that to 30 days from today if I didn't notify you on the date of sentencing. You have 30 days from today to file an appeal with regard to that. To this particular matter? No, to the, this is separate, but to the conviction itself. Thank you, sir. I'm sure your attorney will explain that to you, but if I neglected to tell you that at the time of sentencing, you do have a 30-day right to appeal. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, anything else we have to do today? Your Honor, do we have a, can we docket this and find out when we may expect a decision? Regarding the forfeiture, in particular because I'm going to request a civil bond be posted by the task force. Sorry? I'm going to request that a bond be posted by the task force. They've had it for two and a half years without one. They've made the formal motion for forfeiture. I would be opposed to that, Your Honor. Is there any precedent for them posting a bond? I believe that even, I believe that there's a bond could have been posted even way back when, two and a half years ago, by Ms. McLean. Do you want to post a bond? Do you have the sheet, the thing? What thing? For, like, forfeiture, the bond thing? Ten percent or something along those lines could have been done, and that wasn't. So I'm just saying that once we have forfeiture, I believe a civil bond is appropriate if it's going to be a length of time where they're going to continue to have it. We already are worried about the depreciation of this vehicle. Your Honor, the Commonwealth tried to move this case along, and it was 
because of a, a variety of continuances that it went on as long as it has. Well, actually, from the beginning, uh, within shortly after his arrest, he had a preliminary hearing, and at that time, Agent Fagan stated at that time that he was holding it for forfeiture. So the Commonwealth has made their intent known two and a half years ago, whether it was continued, they had to do that. At that point, there was no discussion about the bond being posted. But I'm seeing under 218A410, anyone else who has a claim to this, um, they're saying an equivalent to 10% of the appraised value of the property with the clerk will be posted um, when there's litigation on that claim. So even if we excuse two and a half years of them holding it, once they filed notice, a forfeiture. I think at that point there needs to be a bond posted. If this is going, if you think your decision is going to take, I would think within a week, unless something unusual happens, uh, we do have a trial next week. Supposed to be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but I don't think there'll be any problem getting it out within a week. Uh, by next Friday, right. next week. Well, in that case, I, I don't see any need on this end. I, I obviously can't speak for Mr. Lane, but if that's, we're fine. if that's the case, we're fine. If you don't have it. Um, contact my office.